on some Twitter Black History presentation. <laughs> we come from the two years. And directly after Sister Fields comes, and we're the head of our preaching for today, Pastor Stephon Gill.
that they were not sending me the ballot. It was going back because they were then starting to see what the world asked them for me to go to. So they were still pregnant with the Jewish Rights People Board to get these seeds. So you had to go to seeds that was allotted to you, and you didn't have a lot of money. There were no loans that was available to you. If it was, they would not tell you, so you didn't know what to ask for. So your parents didn't have a lot of money to send on you, but the little they had, they were willing to send it to see that you got a better education than they had. So today, I think you are blessed, and the young people are very fortunate because they are able to get grants, they are able to get loans, you are able to get a better job. You ha are so fortunate to be blessed to have all of these things available to you. So instead of us wasting our time, wasting our life, and wasting things that we have available to us, take it and make good of it. I am the Lester Fripp Angel. to go before the Lord in prayer, we are definitely welcome to approach the altar if you so desire, and you can maintain your place. As it was just spoken, we have a lot to be thankful for. Thank you, Father God, for everything before we ask you for anything. We thank you, Father God, for how far you've brought us. When we look back in the rearview mirror of our lives, we see a rough road that we've traveled. But God, you've been faithful. You've steered us the right way, Father God many trials, toils, and snares, and somehow, some way, you found a way and saw fit to bring us together in the house of the Lord today, waking us up this morning, touching us with your finger of love, Father God. We thank you, Father God, just for the opportunity to lift up praises to your son, Jesus Christ, Father God. ask that you would just give us more strength, Father God, as we go forward. We want to render our reasonable service today. As we take a moment just to reflect on the past, Father God, we thank you for all the provision that you've given us. We thank you for keeping us healthy, Father God, keeping us strong, Father God. We ask that you would place a hedge of protection around our children. relationships, Father God, whether that between father and son, whether that between mother and daughter, whether that be between husband and wife, brother or sister, Father God. We ask that you would just build them up where they may be torn down right now, Father God. Continue to hold together marriages, Father God. We ask that you would just 
Touch those that may be sick, Father God, that may be dealing with some kind of illness or ailment. We especially lift up Larry Henry, who's in St. Luke right now, Father God. He's hoping to be released today, Father God. We ask that you would give him a reason for the hope that is in him, Father God, that he'd be able to come out and tell the story of your glory, of what you've done just for him, Father God. We ask that you would touch that situation right now, Father God. Please prepare our hearts as we are about to hear a word, Father God. We ask that you would give us listening ears and tender hearts. We ask that you would uh, touch the preacher of the hour and the person of Reverend Stephon Skinner. That you would reveal to us in public you have shown him in private, Father God. Give him the fresh preaching power to be able to instruct and inspire this congregation gathered here today. And Father God, we'll be ever so careful to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor, Father God. We ask these and all of the blessings in the precious and powerful name of your son, Jesus Christ. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, the church said, Amen. 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 Are you ready for the word of the Lord today? Amen. I want you to open your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians. Book of 2 Corinthians. I'd like to worry your patience for just a little while and read through a lengthy portion of chapter 4. All who are able to stand, if you wouldn't mind standing, we'll share the gospel remnants of God's word in our worship today. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Second Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse number 1, it reads this way, therefore, Seeing we have this ministry, and we have received mercy, we faint not. We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, to whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. The God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. For then death worketh in us, but life in you. 
amen. You, you may take your seats. You may take your seats. Uh, this is a text that I've kind of just been studying over the years, and a lot of times we hear it preached a lot of times to preachers. Text we say ministers, but all of us are ministers. All of us have a have a duty and a responsibility to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, a text or a subject this morning, it's on the screen. Attributes of Christian ministry. Attributes of Christian ministry. This this text doesn't quite fit in the full genre and full movement of these first several chapters of Second Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, many believe, is 3 Corinthians, but there is a lost book that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. We do have the record of 1 Corinthians, and 1 Corinthians is a chastising book. It's a, it's a book of correction to a very sensual and sexual and sinful church in a city that is characterized by the same type. And Paul writes this corrective book to the church that he founded a few years earlier. He writes back this corrective book. First Corinthians telling them what the people of Chloe's house had told him and what he has heard from those who are making reports of carnality and sexuality and the idolatry that exists in the Corinthian church that mirrors the Corinthian city. Then he speaks very poignantly and very specifically about a man who has sexual relations with his father's wife, either his stepmother or some other kind of incestuous experience. And Paul says he should be dealt with and dealt with sternly. But they've not dealt with him. They've swept it under the rug. They've ignored and overlooked it. And now the burden of judgment and discipline falls upon Paul, the apostle. And as he writes back to the Corinthian church to remind them of their responsibility to be the church, he chastises in the first letter. He rebukes in the first letter. He corrects in the first letter. And obviously there's some change that has happened between letter one and here we have our letter three, which is our record of letter two. There are some changes that have happened because Paul is much more conciliatory now. He's much more reasonable in the tone of his writing. He's now telling them, I've forgiven the man. You should forgive him and receive him back into the fold. He's conciliatory. And then he stops right after dealing with the reconciliation, dealing with this moment of correction, then receiving again. He speaks about Moses and the ministry of Moses and how the law required and how the law brought debt, but the spirit brings life. And then he brings or slips chapter 4 right into this long soliloquy of chapter. He's writing and he takes the spotlight off of the Corinthian church. He takes the spotlight off of the law of Moses and he turns the spotlight on to those who serve the people of God. And he writes this fourth chapter almost in a parenthetic perspective. He writes this fourth chapter not talking about people like he did before. Not talking about believers in the church. Not talking about church membership at large, even though the principles can be extracted for our use. But Paul is specifically talking about all of us who have the responsibility as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In his fourth chapter, he is speaking to those who share in the gospel. Dr. Warren Wisby puts it this way. Ministry starts when divine resources meet human needs through loving human channels. Ministry is seen as service to God and to people in the name of Jesus Christ for the glory of God. Broadly speaking, being a servant of Christ makes one a Christian minister. A minister is literally a servant. And our job is not simply to lay God's high standards on people as Moses did, but to provide God's grace to them as the Holy Spirit's agents. Christians are to minister to others out of their devotion to Christ and their love for others, whether the other people are believers or unbelievers. Ministry to others should be impartial and unconditional and always seeking to help others as Jesus would. And here's what Paul has to say. When you look at the attributes for Christian ministry, the first thing he says is we have to have a ministry of mercy. We have to have a ministry of mercy. Verse 1 says it. He says we have received mercy. Because we receive mercy, we do not faint. Now, Paul is speaking specifically here about we have a ministry. And then he says, as we receive mercy, we have a ministry as we have received mercy. So what he's saying is, we have a ministry mercifully. He's saying that we have a ministry that we do not deserve. We have a ministry that we have not earned. 
We have a ministry that we should not brag and boast about. We have a ministry that we should not be serving as a minister in. We have a ministry, and because we have this ministry, we have no reason to faint, quit, turn around, and step back. Here's what he's saying. If you're going to be effective in ministry, you're going to have to understand mercy. If you don't understand mercy, you will fail at doing ministry. Because, mercy, because ministry is done both out of mercy and it's done because of mercy. Are you understanding this? It, it bothers me whenever I see churches and, and pastors and people and these, these, these mega churches brag about who they are and what they have and how much money the church is bringing in and, and, and how, they, how many members they have and act as if they've done that on their own. Not realizing anybody who the Lord uses to share the word of God with the people of God is a vessel of mercy. With all that God knows about you and me, I'm amazed that he calls us into ministry. I'm amazed that he chooses to use me with all that he knows about me. How dare we stand before the people of God and act like we did all of that, like we have the ability, like we have the anointing, like I'm so anointed. The devil is a liar. We are here because God is a merciful God. We are alive because God is a merciful God. We serve in ministry because God is a merciful God. We share the word of God because he looked beyond our faults and saw our needs. Jesus is not impressed with your title, with your position, with you coming to church, with you reading the Bible. Jesus is concerned about whether or not, he's not concerned about whether or not you're doing the right thing or loving others or joining church or giving money or even being kind or getting baptized or serving faithfully. He wants to know that when you stand before a holy God, that all of your righteousness is like filthy rags. And none of us can dare come before a holy God and act like we got it all together. Not, not, not me with all the issues I got, with all the skeletons in my closet, with all the stuff I got. I just want to say, Lord, have mercy on me. I, I, I'm a sinner. And I'm, I'm looking all around the church. Today, folk who are singing unto the Lord who are sinners, shouting unto the Lord who are sinners in need of the Lord's mercy, preaching the gospel right now, a sinner who needs the Lord's mercy. All of us must admit that each of us is a sinner who's in need of the Lord's mercy. Is there anybody in here who will say you don't have everything together, you don't dot every I and cross every T, but you're grateful that the Lord has given you mercy? And thank God he doesn't give us everything that we deserve, but he holds back his wrath. He, he holds back his judgment. He holds back his discipline. He gives you brand new mercies every day. And somebody ought to be grateful for the mercy of the Lord. You, you, you got to make sure with your church going self, that you don't get so self-righteous. You, you, you got to make sure with your Bible toting self that you don't look down your nose at somebody else. I don't care how bad off they might be. They in here because everybody in here needs the same Savior. Everybody in here needs the same God. Everybody in here needs the same mercy. I don't care if she got alcohol on her breath right now. She's in the right place at the right time. I don't care if you know all his business. He's in the right place at the right time. All of us need a God who grants us mercy. You, you, you can't keep coming to church every week going out of here looking like you bigger and badder than everybody else. In the kingdom of God, there are no big eyes and little U's. When we see Jesus, he gonna call us servants. Ain't nobody gonna have a title when we see Jesus. You ain't gonna be deacon in heaven. You ain't going to be preacher in heaven. You ain't going to be brother so-and-so in heaven. When we get to, when we get to heaven, he's going to call us servants. Because all of us are just like every last one of us in the sight of our God. I, I, I tell people often, if you knew what God knew about me, you wouldn't want to hear me preach. But, but we minister because of mercy. But then we, miss, we minister out of mercy. It is people who have received mercy who can extend mercy. A person who hasn't received mercy doesn't know how to give it. Now, understand that you may not know what mercy is, but you know that grace is getting what you do not deserve, right? So mercy, that is, not getting what you do deserve. Mercy, to understand it, it presupposes that there is a sin. Mercy, to understand it, it presupposes that there is an error, an infirmity, a weakness. There is a, a blot and a stain on a man's soul. He needs mercy, and the fact that he needs mercy presupposes that he understands that they, he, he is a wicked, undone, wretched, and foul person. People who are self-righteous, 
or, or, or pseudo-righteous, they never ask for mercy. People who think they are holy any of themselves, they never ask for mercy. But when somebody says, God, have mercy on me, that's a person who understands that automatically recognizes I'm a wretch undone, and I'm, like the songwriter says, a worm, and I am in need of God's mercy. Now, when the preacher stands in the position of mercy, when the, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the priest stands in the position of mercy, he has a tender heart to those who come inside the church who are broken and bruised and made mistakes in their life. The preacher doesn't judge them because he's received the same mercy that they need. He's received the exact same mercy that they need. And so he says, we have this ministry just as we have received mercy. Don't quit because there will be days that you want to quit. There'll be days when you ask yourself, God, and a few other people, why did you get into this? And you'll want to quit. He says, don't quit. When folk get on your nerves, don't quit. When, when they hurt your heart, don't quit. When they turn your back on you, don't quit. When they don't see vision, don't quit. When they fight what God is saying to you, don't quit. Because just like you got mercy, show them some mercy. The attributes for Christian ministry, first of all, shows us we have a ministry of mercy. Second thing I see is that we have a ministry of integrity. Look at the second verse. He says, now we renounce the hidden things of dishonesty. We're not walking in craftiness or handling the word of God with deceitful intentions, but we're manifesting the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience. A ministry of integrity, 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 and that word sincerity. You see these things jumping out at you in verse 2. It says, not walking in dishonesty. Dishonesty is whenever I know the truth and I don't express the truth. Dishonesty is for me to have information and I do not share it with you. That's dishonest. It is from the root word where we get honor from. Dishonest or honesty comes from the same root word honor. They both have Latin etymological roots. And honor, it means whenever I have high esteem and integrity. Honor is whenever I live my life with esteem to ascribe to a high value to my life. That's honor. Honesty is whenever I live my life in that honor. Whole lot of words. Honesty is to live it out before others to see, not having anything in me that I've not shared in you. It's the word sincerity. Sincerity comes from the Greek word that give us the idea of translucence or, or transparency, to be able to see straight through you. And the preacher or the pastor or the priest in this context was to preach so that people could see straight through him. He should not have any mask on his face when he preaches. He should not preach in a way where people can see straight through him. Now, that's scary. That's, that, that's scary. He, he, he shouldn't handle the word of God craftily in a way to masquerade his own mistakes and faults and failures so that, that folk will uh, think highly of him and put him on a pedestal that he does not belong on. He is to preach the word of God in honesty, in integrity, with sincerity and transparency. So much so, he ought to preach like this, that the text says he should commit himself to every man's conscience. This means that a man's conscience, that part of a man that tells him right or wrong, that part of a man that tells him good or bad, the preacher ought to present himself in a way where a man's conscience can identify with the preacher's life and he can register and a connection can be made. Now, that's hard for us to do. Verse, verse, verse 2 is hard to do because we don't want nobody to see through us. Transparency is dangerous in the church. You can, you, can be, you can be transparent everywhere else, but don't try it in the church. You, 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 you'll be castigated in the church. You'll be laughed at in the church. You'll be talked about in the church. You'll be judged what in the church. And here's what he says. He says that we should live our lives in such a way that when we stand, we have nothing to hide. Nothing to hide. If I were to tell you that I've lived my life in such a way that when I stand and talk to people that I have nothing to hide, I would be lying to you. There's been days I've, I've preached, I've talked to people, and I've prayed that folk didn't know what I know. Pray that they didn't see what I see. But here's what I've come to learn. Every person has two things about them. And our job for the rest of our ministry is to bring these two things that are absolutely different in many ways to reconcile them together into one. We all have a reputation before others and a character before God. And our job is to try to bring our reputations and our character in line with each other so that what people know about us matches what God knows about us. 
that when, our li- when we live our lives behind closed doors and our lives b- before others, we'll be presented in such a way that nobody will have a reputable idea of us that is inconsistent with the character that God knows about us. Did, did you catch that? I, I'm not there yet. My character and my reputation, they're not together yet. But every day I'm in ministry, it is my job to ask God to give me the kind of character that matches my reputation. Give me the kind of character that matches what other folk know about me. So that my inward self and my outward being are not miles apart. Are you understanding this? I never understood why God would call such imperfect people to such a perfect message. I never understood why we would trust, he would trust something so precious in the hands of us who are so broken. Because this is a perfect message and it has to be displayed and conveyed through imperfect vessels. And I never understood that. I never, I never understood it until I under, understood the whole idea of glory. And that's the next section of the text. You got to have a ministry of mercy. You have to have a ministry of integrity. And that will give you a ministry of glory. You see, glory... The glory of the ministry has nothing to do with the person. The glory of the ministry is not connected to the glory of the individual. The more inglorious the individual is, the more glorious the ministry becomes. Because the minister, the person, if he or she is glorious, people will put their eyes on them and take their eyes off of Jesus Christ. Are you understanding this? That's why why I'm, I'm, I'm bothered by a lot of bling, bling, flashy, dashy people. I'm bothered by them because if you get... Uh, 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 sometimes they, they come up in these long cars and these Bentleys and uh, these private jets and airplanes and limousines and, and, and I don't think they deserve that. I want to I catch the bus because I don't deserve to ride in such a long car. I get bothered by that because they so flashy because if you're not careful, you'll rob God of the glory. If you're not careful, you'll outshine Christ. If you're not careful, the spotlight will be on you and can't nobody see Jesus. And the reality is Lee Skinner, Tim Johnson, Sean Aguilar, Stephon Skinner never saved anybody. (laughs) Stephon Skinner never healed anybody. Lee Skinner never brought anybody out of the muck and the mire. It is only Jesus. If you see me, you've wasted your time. If you see me, you lost your perspective. We come that we might see Jesus. And so he says, if our gospel is hid, it is here that people cannot see Jesus. It is here to them that are lost and whom the God, little g, of this world have blinded the minds of them that believe not. By veil here, Paul meant obscure. The reason some people did not immediately understand and appreciate the gospel was that Satan had blinded their minds. It was not because Paul had sought to deceive his hearts by making the gospel obscure. The gospel is obscure to those who are lost until the spirit enlightens their minds. Apparently, Paul is responding to criticism that to some, his gospel is no revelation at, at all. In other words, it is veiled. Hear me clearly. There is a conspiracy, a demonic, satanic conspiracy that the enemy is trying to blind the minds, the intellect, the understanding, the reasoning, the rationale of the world from seeing and understanding the gospel. The Spirit of God is illuminating the truth of the gospel, and Satan is on a journey to blind the mind to what the Holy Spirit is illuminating. The God, little g, of this age is not the God, the Father, but it's Satan. He is the one whom this world has made its God. The false teachers accused Paul of preaching an antiquated message, so Paul showed that the problem was not with the message or the messenger, but the hearers who were headed for hell. The preacher cannot persuade people to believe only God can do that. And every time we share the gospel, we stand in that delicate balance between Satan's blinding work and the Spirit's illuminating work, and we have the opportunity to help people see the light and not the darkness. But here's the thing. If we put the spotlight on ourselves and we become the emissary of Satan's army, we become an ally of the enemy's work, and we do more damage to the gospel than we do to aid the gospel, whenever the clergy words... Closure roads. Whenever the closure roads were established, they were established to hide the flesh, to, to cloak the flesh. The purpose of the closure world was to hide it so that men would not see the preacher, but so that men would see God. But we, we've turned that thing so upside down now. It's, it's, it's a swagger now. It's, it's, it's how you look, rocking it now. 
But the reality that I've got to deal with is that I cannot preach myself. I cannot tell people what I want to say. I cannot tell them what they want to hear. I cannot tickle their ears. I cannot spotlight like me. I've got to shine the light on Jesus Christ. I've got to make sure that when I'm done that every man would say in saw Jesus. Because when you're hurting and you have no hope, you need to see Jesus. When you have no money to pay your bills, you need to see Jesus. When your body is sick and you have no answer, you need to see Jesus. When you don't have no food to put on the table, you need to see Jesus. When you have pink slips and yellow slips and red slips and you're about to get evicted, you need to see Jesus. And our job is to be a big finger to point people to Jesus Christ so they know exactly where the answer is. Where, where is the answer? The answer is not in our eloquence. It's not in our academics. It's not in our theological dissertations and our doctrines. The answer is in Christ and Christ alone. And any man who preaches himself and Christ is a heretic. Any man who preaches money and Christ is a heretic. Any man who preaches ideology or sociology and Christ is a heretic. It is Jesus and Jesus alone, solely, solely Christ, only Christ and Christ alone. Even though Paul occasionally needed to commend himself to every man's conscience, he never promoted himself. Instead, he proclaimed Jesus Christ. Just like a faithful slave announces his master rather than himself, this is what he had done in Corinth. He did not conduct himself as the spiritual overlord of these Christians, but he took the role of servant and bound himself to fulfill God's mission for them, which involved serving others. And so he says, the light of the glorious gospel of Christ is covered so that the image of God, who is Christ, ought to shine to them, but cannot shine. So here's what we're not going to do. Verse 5, we preach not ourselves, but Christ our Lord. And when we do talk about ourselves, we should only tell you that we are his servants. It's our job to serve him. Every believer is a servant. Every minister is a slave. I mean, God will wake us up in the morning and give us a word sometimes that we know will not be well received. But we have to find the energy to muster it up and get up uh, in front of people and tell them what will not be well received. And if we don't say it, then part of our integrity is lost. Every minister is a slave. He says, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shine in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Here's what that verse is saying in the way of the world that Paul was preaching. He was simply saying that Christ is all. That, that Christ is all. He was talking to a Gentile or a Greek-influenced church in a Roman-dominated world and preaching to dis dispersed Jews or Hellenized Jews who had the vestiges of their past and their heritage with them. He is coalescing three different groups, Jews, Greeks, and Romans together. And he brings them together in one verse. He brings them together in one verse, the message for all three groups. The Jews, they believed the light. The light is how the Jews saw God. They were lovers of light. That's how they saw God. They were lovers and seekers of light. The Gentiles, they believed in knowledge. And Sophia, they believed in wisdom and knowledge. They were lovers of knowledge. And the Romans believed in glory. They believed they were lovers of glory. The Jews, the light, the Greeks, knowledge, and the Romans, glory. And Paul is saying, God got all of that for each one of you. Look at the text in verse number six. He said, for God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, that's for the Jews. Have shined in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge, that's for the Gentiles. Of the glory of God, the glory that's for the Romans, in the face of Jesus Christ. Here's what he's saying. He's saying to the Jews, if you want to see the light, look at Jesus. To the Gentiles, if you want to have knowledge, look at Jesus. To the Romans, if you want to have glory, look at the glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Because without Christ, there is no light. Without Christ, there is no knowledge. And without Christ, there is no glory. And when he says, God, who commanded, who forced, who made the light shine out of the darkness, won't he do that for you? Yes. Have God ever pricked your conscience where he just made the light shine out of the darkness? Yes. The same God who created physical light in the universe yes. is the same God who must create supernatural light in the soul and usher believers from the kingdom of dark darkness to the kingdom of light. Yes. The light is expressed as the knowledge of God's glory. Yes. You got to have a ministry of mercy. You have to have a ministry of integrity. We have to have a ministry that espouses glory, but lastly, we have to have a ministry that understands excellence. Look at the seventh verse. Look at the seventh verse. He says, but we have this treasure 
and earthen broken clay pots. We have something precious and something broken. We have something perfect and something imperfect. We have something infinite and something that is finite. We have something holy and something that is unholy. Nobody that I know takes their precious diamonds and gems and hides them in a dirty, broken clay pot. When you've got a precious gem or a precious diamond or a precious stone, you put that in a glass box. You put that up on the china cabinet for everybody to see. Nobody puts something precious in something that is broken unless you're trying to hide it. Unless you're trying to keep it from those who would rob it and from those who would steal it and those who would take it away. Then you hide it in unsuspecting places where nobody would know where it is. That's what God did. God knew that the word and the ministry and the gospel was so precious that there would be men who would try to take the credit and the glory for it. So he put the gospel in a broken vessel so the gospel would start shining through. Nobody would give anything credit to the broken vessel. Nobody would ever imagine that somebody as broken and bruised and battered as you and I are could have something so great on the inside of us. God has done this so that all would see the transforming power of the gospel is supernatural and not just human. That's the purpose of the anointing. You'd be, you be surprised who's anointed. You'd be, you be shocked at who's anointed. You think that the person who's anointed ought to be the person who's shining on top. No, he chooses David and not his brothers. He chooses the youngest and not the eldest because he chooses that which is precious, that which is pristine and of high value. He chooses it and puts it in broken clay vessels. So that the vessel does not think that it's more than what it is. Are you understanding this? It was prophesied that he'd come riding in on a donkey. Do you remember that? They said that the Messiah would come riding in on a donkey. Jesus, when he came riding in triumphantly into Jerusalem, he did not mount a horse. He did not mount some regal animal or ride in on a chariot. He got on a donkey. And you know why he got on on the donkey? You know why he got on the donkey? So that when they started throwing palm leaves down at his feet, nobody would throw palm leaves down at a donkey. Nobody would tell a donkey, hell, they all gave the glory to Christ and not to a donkey. Can you imagine a donkey seeing folk throwing palm leaves at you and you walking like you somebody, like you doing something, like you did that? They're not caring anything about you. They ain't caring about nothing about that donkey. It's about who you have riding on you. And who you carrying? It has nothing to do with you, but everything about the person who you're carrying. So he, he specializes in this, in this. He always does what you can't fathom he's going to do. He takes five loaves of bread and two fish and feeds 5,000. And somebody said since he's Jesus, he could have made money, come from anywhere, and go buy enough food to feed everybody. But no, he likes to surprise the bread. If he had fed everybody with money and purchased food from the store, he would have not surprised the bread. And Jesus wanted to shock the bread. So Jesus took what was not enough, and he held it up to God. And when he held it up to God, what was not enough became more than enough. And God made what was not enough more than enough. Dr. Caesar A. Clark, Dr. Caesar A. Clark says it like this. When Jesus lifted up the bread, Jesus and the Father had a conversation about the bread. And Jesus told the Father, the bread doesn't think he's good enough. The bread doesn't think he has enough to offer. The bread doesn't think he's sufficient for the, ta for the, fat, for the task. But Father, would you show the bread what he could be? Would you show the bread his potential? And when the bread saw his potential, when the bread saw that even though I'm just five loaves, if God puts his blessing on me, I can feed 5,000. The bread starts splitting in half and in half and in half and in half because he saw something he never would have imagined if he would see him by himself. Is there anybody in here who ever seen God make a way out of no way? He showed you your potential, showed you what he can do. Isn't it an amazing sight when the Lord put his hands on you and show you what you never could have imagined? These, these jars of clay, these jars of clay, they were, they were cheap, breakable, and replaceable but they serve necessary functions. Sometimes they were used as a vault to store valuables, such as money or, 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 or jewelry or important documents, but they were most often used for holding garbage and human waste. But God uses frail, lowly, common, expendable, replaceable people to make clear that salvation is a result of him. 
We have a treasure in broken vessels so that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Watch this. We are troubled on every side. We are perplexed. We are persecuted. We are cast down. But though we're troubled on every side, we are not in distress. Though we are perplexed, we are not in despair. Though we are persecuted, we do not feel forsaken. Even though we've been knocked down, we have not been knocked out. Do you see the duality in the text? Do you see the, the duality of terms in the text? Do you see the, the double entendre from the inside to the outside being played against each other in the text? Whenever it says that we are troubled, distressed, what we are, persecuted, and cast down, whenever it says what we are, that's stuff happening on the outside. Look at what he says. Troubled. That's from the outside. Perplex, a whole lot of different things happening at once. Perplexing, that's from the outside. Persecuted, that's when folk talk about you, lie on you, laugh on you, mock you. That's on the outside. Cast down, when somebody throws us down, when he says what we are, that's on the outside. That's what you cannot change. That's, that's what you don't have control over. You cannot change what folk do to you. You, you cannot change what will happen in your life. You, you can't change the, the heels and the burdens and the persecutions and the trouble that comes your way. That stuff, you can't change. You can't change a disappointment. You, you can't change when stuff goes bad. That's something you can't change. That's on, the, that's on the outside. The outside is not your concern. The outside is what you not ought to be worried about because the outside has no power on your future if it never affects the inside. The inside, look at what he says. Look at what he says on the inside. The inside, we're troubled on the outside, but we're not stressed. Ever been troubled, but you're not stressed? I got a whole bunch of things going on right now, but I ain't stressing over it. Whenever the preacher gets free of the stresses of his day, Whenever the preacher can mount the pulpit and not have to worry about the stress, God shows up. Look at the text. We are perplexed, but not in despair. That's inside. We are, we, are, we, are, we are persecuted, but not forsaken. Don't have any feelings of rejection and being forsaken. That's, that's inside. We're cast down, but not destroyed. That's, that's inside. Whatever condition the children of God may be in in this world, they have a but not to comfort themselves. Whenever your outside doesn't affect your inside, you know you're doing good ministry then. When your outside doesn't affect your inside, you're doing good ministry then. It's like being in a submarine, submerged in the water and driven down to the bottom of the sea. It doesn't matter what's going on on the top of the water. It may be a storm brewing overhead. It could be lightning flashing, thunder rolling, all hell broken loose above the water. But a submarine, the folk in a submarine, they laughing, eating, playing Uno cards because the submarine has incubated them from the stuff going on on the outside. The submarine is just like the Holy Spirit. When you get the Holy Spirit to cover you, it acts like a submarine and it takes you so deep in the presence and joy and the pleasure of God, you can go down so deep that no matter what's going on on the outside, you got this peace that surpasses all understanding on the inside. You see clearly than you ever have before on the inside. Is there anybody in here who ever had a submarine like to experience? You should have lost your mind, but you still got your joy. You still got your peace. You still got your hope because something is going on on the inside. The, 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 the peace in your home could be violated. Your children can be on drugs. Your, your daughter is pregnant. Your marriage is on the rocks. Bills are due and overdue. You're up, your, your, your job is up for grabs. Your rent is due. Your home is on foreclosure. Your car is on the repossession lift. Your life is in trouble. I'm so broke, I don't know what to do. I've been let down, hurled down, cast down, tripped down, pushed down, knocked down, wrestled down, lowered down, cussed down, hand down, shoved down, knocked down, pressed down, kicked down. But I still will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. There's, there's, there's some times, times have gone past, you don't know what in the world or how in the world you were going to survive. There was some trouble that was mounting all around you and on top of you, and it almost took you out. And if the truth be told, some folk don't know half your testimony. And if they knew all the stuff you went through, they wouldn't believe you still in your, mind, your right mind right now, sitting in that, that little blue pew you in, 
if some folk knew all the hell you went through, they wouldn't believe you can say amen, but somebody can testify if you take all the trouble of 2019, 18, 17, 16, and all the years that came before it, if you don't have a but not testimony, I had trouble, but the Lord helped me. I've been through the storm and the rain, but the Lord helped me. I had some heartache, sickness, and pain, but the Lord helped me. Friends are few and fickle, but the Lord helped me. Family didn't understand me, but the Lord helped me. The reason I'm in here today, because if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, I wouldn't be in here today, but the Lord helped me. But God, but God, don't you worry about what's going on the outside, but God is on the inside of you. He who created a good work. I didn't get here by myself. I, I didn't get here because I got all the right hookups on the earth. I got a hookup in heaven and he helps me. The Bible says I will lift up my eyes to the hills from which come in my help. My help comes from the Lord. You need a ministry of mercy. We need a ministry of integrity. You have to have a ministry of glory. But the ministry of excellence is only going to come from Jesus Christ. The deeper you go, the more excellent you become. I'm, 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 I'm an impatient person. That's a, that's a large fault of mine. And I, I've made some critical errors in ministry, huge mistakes. Somehow I thought that I was responsible until God allowed a problem. Until God allowed a problem to occur in my life that I could not solve. But when I learned to turn everything over to Jesus, he took what I could not do. He took what I did not have the power to complete, and he did exceedingly. He did abundantly. He did above all I could ask or think. And is there anybody in here who ever had to let God fight your battles? When... When you're at your wit's end, that's when God is at his extremity. That's when God shows up. That's when God shows out. And I dare you, I dare you today to trust him. I dare you to lean on him. God bless you with these attributes of Christian ministry. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. Lord, the best model and example that we have of ministry is your son, Jesus Christ. He was the ultimate servant. He was the one that made the total sacrifice, the biggest sacrifice, and Lord, all throughout the scriptures, we see Jesus as a servant, laying his life on the line for other people. So Lord, allow us to remember that all of us, in our personal ministries, in our communal ministries, the ministry of the, Je of the, of the church of Jesus Christ, it is a ministry ultimately of your glory. Because of what your son Jesus Christ did, we are able to serve in ministry. Because of what your son Jesus Christ did, we are able to tell others about his goodness. And God, we don't just tell them about how good he's been in our lives, but what he can do in their life as well. So Lord, the same way that you granted us mercy, allow us to grant that same mercy to other individuals same way that you had a ministry of integrity that although you were the savior of the world you still came into this world and became a human being and allowed us to sit with you and fellowship with you and see you as a man but Lord we thank you for your glory 
because of your glory, we are able to do ministry in an excellent way. And it's not about the ministry of the Good Shepherd Church. It's not about the ministry that we serve in. But it's about the ministry of Jesus Christ. It's about the gospel. It's about the truth. Lord, so we thank you today. We pray that the word did not fall on deaf ears. But there's one who heard the preach word. And you will move on their hearts to give their lives to your son, Jesus Christ, today. Lord, it's in your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.